just being born at the right time in history, in the right place. For me, leadership is obviously providing um, the support and the vision to enable a team to accomplish a shared goal. Personal and professional point of view combined, my wife is a fantastic role model. So is a professional society serving a professional community around the world. I'm motivated by and dedicated to uh, the premise that an individual can make a difference in the world and make it a better place for all. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Onco Influencers on Onco Daily. And today is a great honor and pleasure for me to welcome Dr. Clifford Hadis, uh, the CEO of American Society of Clinical Oncology. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Hadis, for, for having the time for us. Uh, I'll just make a short introduction, although I'm sure anyone in oncology field does not need a, this introduction. But uh, anyway, I'll do just a few uh, sentences and we'll go further. Dr. Hadis is the Chief Executive Officer of ASCO, as I mentioned. He also serves as the Executive Vice Chair of uh, the Conquer Cancer Foundation. Previously, he uh, served in a variety of volunteer and leadership roles at ASCO, including its uh, president during the Society's 50th anniversary in 2013-2014. Before coming to ASCO full-time, he was the Chief of Breast Medicine Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York and Professor of Medicine at Wale Cornell. As CEO of ASCO, Dr. Hadis is responsible for delivering on the board's strategic goals through research, education, and promotion of the highest quality, equitable patient care by the society's nearly 50,000 members. Uh, Dr. Hadis, what's the key to your success? <laughs> um, maybe uh, just being born at the right time in history, in the right place with uh, supportive family and uh, an environment that allowed me to learn what I needed to learn, focus on what was interesting and contribute in the way that I've gotten to. Uh, who is your mo role model, Dr. Hadis? Well, I don't have a single role model, but for different aspects of my life, I have a number of role models. Um, and I, I guess I don't really know exactly which way to start, but from um, a personal and professional point of view combined, my wife is a fantastic role model, having um, taught me a great deal about, um, about both how to um, function, be efficient and accomplish a lot, uh, but also how to be connected and humane at the same time. Um, professionally, in a more narrow sense, uh, I was very fortunate in the early part of my career to have a really remarkable mentor, uh, Larry Norton at, uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And that was happenstance. It, it ties back in a way to the first question you asked about secret to my success. And, and I said a lot of it was just in a sense being in the right place at the right time. In this case, uh, I was at Memorial as a first year fellow when Larry was hired uh, to really ramp up a breast medical oncology program. And so I was part of the build out of that program. And that gave me an opportunity to see a wide range of both scientific um, precision, translational um, medicine practicalities, but also at the same time, um, group dynamics and leadership skills that I think are hard to teach and uh, really important to learn. So uh, those are certainly a couple. In this role at ASCO, another important mentor or, or role model, I should say, for me was, of course, my predecessor, Alan Lichter, who served as the CEO for about a decade. And many of the things that he repeatedly would say and that he modeled and taught me are things that I've tried to uh, incorporate into my own leadership here at ASCO because they were uh, thoughtful and effective. Thank you very much. Uh, what, I mean, 
what what was the most important thing you learned from Dr. Norton? I've seen your photo on Twitter. You 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 were saying like every CEO needs a mentor, right? With him. Yeah. Well, I mean, um, so, so a couple of things. I think Larry was always uncompromising in pursuit of the very best science with relevance to the care of the patients. And I think that focus was was the most important thing. The second thing was he used that enthusiasm to rally an ever-growing team of people behind that, that goal. And I think without saying that it was strategic planning, it was really good modeling of the importance of clarity and strategic planning. So he was the president of ASCO in 21, 22, right? And then you became Larry? the president. Yeah. No. 2001, 2002. Norton? Yeah. It was, I think, the president in 1998, more or less. Okay. Like, uh, yeah. he was the, like, I, I, ASCO No, president. that matters because there was a transition inside Memorial at that time where he stepped down as the chief of the breast cancer medicine service and that's when i became the chief oh okay i see so he i was when he, was president of that. he was also president and then his mentee like also became the president of asco should we expect about, uh, but, but to be about 18 years later yeah yeah so should we expect like 18 years after your presidency one of your mentees to be <laughs> be that would be are you preparing someone to <laughs> okay. Uh, during your theme as a president of ASCO, it was the science and society. Right. You gave the lecture with the title Science and Society 50 years later. 10 years passed since your lecture. Anything you would like to add or say about it? Well, let me say a couple of things. First of all, that theme was of the time we were in then. It is, however, absolutely relevant today. Um, and, and I'll expand on what I mean. At the time, one of the things that was concerning to me was that there seemed to be a growing schism between the way that the scientific community thought about evidence, data, and recommendations, action, and so forth, and the way that the lay public in some cases was thinking about it. Outside of oncology, but related um, was the developing educational debate at that time about teaching Darwinian evolution in public schools. That was just one example of this, um, but there were others. And what I hoped at the time that we would do would be to increase the communications between the general public and the scientific community, and that we would use, um, in some cases, frankly, a diagnosis of cancer and the deeply scientific evidence-based approach we strive to deliver across the world in oncology as an opportunity to show people the value and importance of scientific method and process. Part of this relates to understanding that most answers are not final, that the process of science is the process of questioning and evolving new answers. And it means that when we change our, seemingly our opinion on something over a period of time, it's not that we were overtly right or wrong at any given moment. It's that the understanding of the world evolves and we get better at it. And sometimes that looks like we're just changing our uh, opinions and that can feel like whipsawing almost the general public in some cases but understanding that that's the process we go through and how we get there and that there are ethical well-meaning hard-working people behind it was really the the goal to de decrease the suspicion if you will of scientific recommendations now unfortunately we all know what's happened in the last decade including the years of the covid pandemic and certainly in some parts of the world, there has been a backlash against scientists and the scientific method that in some cases has truly harmed us uh, and set back some 
of the um, translation and application of the very progress that we're so dedicated to achieving. And I think that this is really tragic. Um, and I think you almost could see this as another version of an evolving divide in the world. People talk about elites and non-elites, the haves and the have-nots, but increasingly there's a risk that the people who understand and embrace uh, the scientific method and therefore engage in best practices, evidence-based practices, are, are going to find themselves with better health than the people who are unfortunately rejecting all of that. Yeah. Uh, leadership development is a key ASCO effort to ultimately build and deliver a better future for patients with cancer. That's your words, right? Mm -hmm. Right. What is leadership for you? Well, I have obviously found myself a leader at multiple phases of my career. Uh, I was made the chief of breast cancer medicine at Memorial Sloan Kettering when I was in my late 30s. I was pretty young for that. And here I'll just interject that I never had formal training in any aspects of management, business administration, leadership as such. Um, my experience is uh, typical, or at least it was, and it is part of the reason for ASCO's deepening dedication to providing leadership development and leadership tools for all of our members. This is not something that's necessarily taught. In my case, it was well modeled as we've already discussed and I had the benefit of very effective mentors who were leaders. Uh, but the real question is how do we get all of that out to, to the rest of our community, all of which needs it. So, um, but, but to answer your question more specifically, for me, leadership is obviously providing um, the support and the vision to enable a team to accomplish a shared goal. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm, I'm going to use also this opportunity to thank for all, I mean, for, for me personally, ASCO made a lot of things. I mean, I was an idea recipient, then life recipient, and then right. also leadership development program and volunteered also volunteering for the committees. So ASCO made really, uh, I mean, life change. It was a life changing for experience for me. And you might not remember, but in 2016, we had a very short discussion in Paris during the World Cancer Leaders Summit when you asked me, okay, I remember your face. I mean, you were one of the life or idea recipients. What's your like, what did you accomplish? So you were checking, I mean, at very short discussion. And I asked, I mean, why you are asking? You said, because I want to know, I mean, what, what like our kind of people who, I mean, we invested in what they are doing and where are they doing? I mean, this was a discussion which resonated later on with me, certainly. And I think, I mean, this is also a very important part of the leadership, especially if you are leading a huge society, which is covering all over the globe from like students up to the, I don't know, very senior people. Uh, when I go through your posts and social media, it's very clear that, I mean, you care a lot about the health equity and about the disparities. You raise a lot of, I mean, questions about it and the voice. How you see it right now, the health equity and disparity, and what, what we should do more to make it better a place? So, so we became doctors and oncologists um, to take care of everybody. And the issue of, of health equity is a really basic issue for me, which simply is every human deserves access to the optimal care and best possible outcomes for whatever ails them. And that's the fundamental simple goal of, of our health equity efforts. It is obviously, it has been true both within the United States and around the world for as long as we've been in modern medicine, that that is an elusive goal, that there are many, many groups of people 
who for a variety of reasons do not have access to what we know from scientific evidence is the best possible care. And each time anybody is denied optimal care, the whole world suffers because whatever talent, skills, contributions those individuals might make over their lifetime, they are compromised when their health is compromised. So it's, in my opinion, not even that lofty a goal. It's a shared benefit for us to pursue health equity. Now, more narrowly, uh, in the United States in particular, uh, we have been able to see with greater and greater clarity which factors identify individuals and groups of people who have excessive barriers to care. And uh, nobody can, in a sense, solve this whole problem overnight. But what we are dedicated to doing is identifying those places where our skills and ability as a professional society are able to, in some way, move um, us all forward. And, and that's the, the issue. So because it is so important, not to just to me, but to our board and our membership, it is a cross-cutting component of our current five-year strategic plan. And it's related, by the way, to the second cross-cutting component, which is making a global impact. These two cross-cutting initiatives are, I think, in, inextricably tied together because making global impact in many cases relates to addressing access to care and research uh, issues. Uh, I say that they're cross-cutting because our intention is for these two efforts to touch and shape all ASCO activities. Uh, collaboration is the key, right? And recently you joined the efforts with the American Cancer Society for creating a joint platform. I mean, usually it's like, uh, I mean, it, the societies are not societies, but in general organizations and people are very difficult to give something uh, kind of, or to share something. Uh, what's your thoughts about it? By, by the way, I mean, just to, continue what I said, our mutual friend, uh, uh, Richard Sullivan, was giving an example. He was telling that like there are two kinds of people, right? The people of reason and people of uh, vanity. And by the way, and he was telling that if there are like more leaders who are people of reason, uh, we would get a better place in the world. And when you were discussing, he was giving your example as a people of reason. Oh, that's nice. Oh. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> this particular collaboration is somewhat unusual. Um, and I would say it's one of those things where we identified a win-win-win. And let me elaborate. Um, ASCO is a professional society serving a professional community around the world. And our job, if you think about it, um, is to enable each of our individual members to have all the tools, resources uh, they need to deliver the highest quality cancer care. So while the end result of our work should be ever higher quality of cancer care, the specific role we play is to enable the individual physicians, nurses, others to access the tools and resources they need to do that. Okay. Along the way, many, many years ago, ASCO was gifted a patient-facing educational resource. It actually had this very long name. It came from a commercial um, a pharmaceutical company that could no longer, I think, uh, provide it because of issues around advertising and promotion. Um, but it had the original name, People Living with Cancer. And then it was shortened over the years to cancer.net. It grew into a beloved resource for ASCO, uh, several hundred volunteers providing the highest quality award-winning content, um, keeping it up to date. It had both disease-specific treatment information and also it had um, blogs and breaking news in terms of scientific or clinical scientific progress. All of that was great. Among our challenges was that it was not um, well recognized by the using community. The number one site for cancer information in the United States, the last time we looked was 
cancer.org, which in fact is the website of the American Cancer Society. And in contrast to what I just said, the American Cancer Society's primary audience are patients and families with cancer. They're not a professional society. So several years ago, it occurred to me that, and others, that in, a, in an ideal world, we wouldn't be competing to do this good, which was to deliver patient information. We would be collaborating. And I began discussions at that time with the leadership of the American Cancer Society because in a sense, I, with some jealousy, wanted their viewership. I wanted our award-winning content to be seen by the numbers of people who they were drawing. Uh, and said another way, if we were going to invest the time and effort in creating this award-winning content, it should be seen by the maximum number of people. Uh, so we began discussions. And when their current CEO, Karen Knudsen, came in um, uh, and I began to talk with her in the very first days that she was on the job about her leadership approach and resources and, and how she was going to address some of the many complex challenges that face them as, a, as, a, as an organization, I offered up the possibility of collaborating on this issue as well. And we began it as a pilot. We started in particular with the ASCO um, post-treatment survivorship care plans and the screening and prevention guidelines that were really part of the ACS website. And we began to cross-reference the websites to see if we could save a little bit of time and effort um, by using each other's resources on the fringes. And that worked well. It gave us confidence and courage that we could collaborate further. And then in the last year and a half or so, uh, we really rolled up our sleeves and committed to joining this effort. Now it isn't finished yet, I should say. This process of putting it all together is going to take at least 18 more months. But what we've already done is to retire cancer.net and begin to collaborate uh, on the material. And uh, the give and take of this is that the ASCO material is branded as such on the American Cancer Society website. So I am hoping that as this works out, we will reach more people. Our name will be associated with high quality content that benefits uh, the broader community. And we will all save some money, time and effort because there'll be uh, much less duplication of effort across our community broadly. Thank you very much. Really very important effort. Um, in 2011, when you were just starting your position, during the interview, you were talking about ASCO being global and international, and you mentioned the former logo with the globe. But the, the logo changed and now is without the globe, although it's clear that ASCO's global involvement increased significantly during your yeah. term. Well, um, I just want to just interject here. I think we are, con um, there are two issues here. I was on the board of directors 2008 to 11. Uh -huh. And I was the president of ASCO 2011 through 14. In 2016, after departing the board as an elected volunteer, I came back as a full-time employee as a CEO. In that era, which was a half decade later, um, one of the things that struck me is we have this lapel pin. Here's an example that you know we often wear. Uh, and I would get on an airplane and people who didn't know ASCO would look at it and they wouldn't see the globe. They would see ASC and then this small thing that was indeed meant to be both the O and the globe. Um, in the interest, I would say with humility, recognizing that we are not a household name. And in the interest of clarity of communication and standardization, at that time, in the first year that I was here, we adopted this, uh, it's over here, sorry, this, this way. <laughs> um, yeah, this uh, simple font, and it's universal, it's the same font it across really all ASCO's entities. It's a, and it's really meant because, um, our, our name, again, is not household known. We need to make it easy for people to see it and know what it is. Yeah, to continue, but like really the global involvement is increasing and certainly oh, there is- much more now. That's right. 
but but changing the 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 branding of ASCO was really just done to to improve uh, external communications. Uh, what's your plans for the for the like getting more global involvement? Well, we are of course a member driven organization, and about a third of our members right now are outside, drawn from outside the U.S. Um, it all starts with a very simple idea. There are roughly, what, 335, 340 million Americans right now, and more or less 8 billion people on Earth. So um, it's hard to say that you are relevant to the global community if you're only serving uh, roughly 4 or 5% at best of the world's population. And it's true that our name is American, but that's actually a good thing in this regard because, of course, the high quality science and research clinical care uh, in America is something that I think the world has respect for and in most cases wants to be associated with. However, that doesn't diminish our aspiration, which is to make an impact globally. And so um, in that regard, um, we have done several things in recent years. The first is a practical thing. Um, we have simplified our overall membership model. We just launched that in March of 2024. But somewhat related to that, even back about a year and a half earlier, we stopped charging membership fees for professionals from low and low middle income countries. And this is both to achieve our mission, which is to reach people who might not have the resources to join ASCO, uh, but it's also a long-term investment because optimistically, I believe some of those countries will rise out of the low or low middle income group. And actually, therefore, their members will begin to qualify to pay for, um, for some of the services and, and, and membership here at ASCO. The second thing, of course, is within ASCO, we have departments, but ASCO consists of more than the 501c3 tax exempt organization that you're used to. There is the associated C6, which is our association for clinical oncology. And that's where a lot of our policy and domestic lobbying activities take place, um, as well as some of our quality programs. There's also, of course, Conquer Cancer, which is our associated foundation. And um, because of that, there are certain activities that transcend the C3 that need to touch all three of the big organizations in ASCO now. And for that purpose, we have been increasingly creating what we call centers. So unlike a department, a center may or may not have externally facing products, but it's responsible internally for coordinating activities across departments and across entities. And of course, we have our Center for Research and Analytics, our Center for Ethics and Integrity in the Law, our Center for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. And this year, we added our Center for Global Impact. And this was an upgrade of our former International Affairs Department. And all of this is to enable us not only to gather more resources to make a global impact, but also to be sure that those resources are made available to all the components of ASCO and its entities, uh, and that we have the efficiencies of scale that, that we can gain by doing these things in a coordinated way across all of ASCO. And uh, just you know, to close that out, our hope is that over the years, what knowledge and access gaps might exist across different parts of the world, and I'm not even saying that they're greater uh, access uh, or availability in the U.S. I'm just saying that there are gaps in multiple directions, and therefore we can both um, narrow those gaps and learn from the people who have successfully achieved progress in various parts of the world, and in some cases import that. Um, and, and, you know, this is an area of, I would say, like, ongoing low-level excitement. We're excited every day about what's happening globally. And what we see is steady incremental progress that we find really, really uh, rewarding. Thank you. Uh, what's the thing you're proudest of? Oh, in my professional life or I mean, 
you, you can you know, ask wherever you want. Well, I mean, you know, my personal life, it's it's my family and and um what happiness we've been able to uh, create for ourselves uh and uh, the way in which we are able to contribute and make an impact and a difference in the world. Certainly, that's one way to answer your question. Uh, within ASCO, I can be a little more granular and say, um, having arrived here in 2016, uh, and, and when I arrived, having arrived to a really high-functioning and well-resourced, well-oiled machine, I am proud that we've been able to take those assets and further refine and organize them through um, gradual evolution in the style and function of the actual leadership of the organization, the creation of an adherence to a strategic plan and the development of a budgeting process that's closely tied to that strategic plan. Uh, all of this has allowed us, I think, to um, prioritize with greater and greater precision and be clear about what we can do and will do versus those things that we shouldn't be doing, even if they're good things for the world. And even if the things that need to be done, they're not things that we necessarily are best able to do. Having those discussions with clarity and being able to make choices, I think is uh, represents a significant next stage in ASCO's evolution and growth. And I am proud to be able to to, that we've been able to do that. Um, to turn it just one more way, but it's related. Um, and, and I think if you talk to leaders who were in position through COVID, you hear this more often than you may realize, navigating through COVID as difficult and challenging as it was for so many of us also uh, reflected, I think, uh, on the skills and resources and resilience of so many members of our team, so many of the ASCO staff, uh, they made it possible for us to get through that um, in a way that I, I think in retrospect wasn't necessarily predicted. And, and I am proud that we were able to do that together. Um, you said on a personal note, of course it's your family. Can you tell a bit more about your family? Well, um, so my, Wife is a business executive uh, with her own uh, laudable career. Uh, and I have two grown uh, children who um, are thriving in their professional careers. It makes me very, very happy. Doctors or no? No, no, no physicians. Uh, if there's any disappointment in my life, that's it. But that's not to say I'm disappointed in them. What they've chosen to do is important and makes a difference. Thank you. You enjoy reading. What are your top three books? Oh, God. Well, it's always, of course, changing. Um, I just went back, funny enough, um, about uh, three weeks ago and read Norman Mailer's um, The Naked and the Dead. I don't know why I went back to read that just now, but um, it was interesting to me because one of the things that I've been struck by in recent years is that as challenging and difficult as the current day can often feel, I'm not convinced that everything is that different from how it was many, many decades ago. And reading Naked and the Dead, there were subtle themes around uh, misogyny, racism, and so forth that uh, aren't that different from what we see today. That's not to say um, that we haven't made progress because we actually clearly have, but the way he describes people talking and what they thought isn't seemingly that different. And I'm echoing something from a couple years ago when I read David McCullough's uh, biography of Truman. It really struck me that, that President Truman faced an unbelievably divided country, a country where it was unsafe for him to go and campaign personally for re-election because of his um, fledgling anti-racist steps. And so when you think about that level of divisiveness in the United States, 
and then you compare it to where we are today, sometimes it starts to seem familiar rather than so different. Um, another book, though, that I have to say I really found amazing was Covenant of Water, which I read in part because I had enjoyed cutting for stone, but also, of course, um, Lynn Schuchter this year invited Abraham Bergace, the author, uh, who is himself a physician, to speak at the opening ceremony of ASCO. And if you haven't watched that, if listeners to this show haven't watched that online, it's worth the 20 minutes or so. Unfortunately, he actually got COVID and he did this remotely by uh, live Zoom, but I don't think it mattered. He, he was a compelling presence in that opening ceremony, despite being remote. And the book, of course, ends up being uh, more about medicine than it might seem at first. And he talked about that, about the power of touch, the physical exam in particular in his opening ceremony remarks. So um, those are, are a few. There are a number of others. Uh, I'm fortunate to belong to a book club and we meet quarterly and assign ourselves a book. And we generally um, talk about the book for 60 to 90 minutes before deteriorating into uh, cocktails and dinner. But it's really a, 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 a wonderful group and it stimulates continuous reading. I'll say one more small thing, which is interesting. I, I just thought of it, but my mother who's 86 years old and uh, of course retired um, is an, has always been an unbelievably voracious reader. All through my childhood, we went to the library to get books. That was just an activity for us. And she shares my Kindle account. And so um, she constantly prompts me to buy her books, which uh, <laughs> keeps me exposed to uh, to various uh, new, new things to read. That's nice. When can we expect a book from Dr. Clifford Huddis? I know I don't once know. you said it's... you want to be also a writer. Yeah, so I write every week a uh, blog for the staff. I started to do this in maybe the last week of February of 2020 as the pandemic was um, uh, was really impacting us. I got very concerned about the emergence of full-time remote work and what it would mean culturally for our staff. And so to try to both enhance seemingly emergent acute communications, but also to keep us bound together culturally, I began to write. I began as a habit to write every Sunday for Monday morning. Um, as the pandemic evolved, as we came back into the office, I'm in the office today, of course, and we have been for a couple of years, I continued to write because I decided it was a good way as a leader to let the staff and colleagues know what I was thinking about, what I had seen that week, what I was um, planning. Um, and my blog, therefore, has become a, I don't know, 45 week per year um, summation of almost everything that's going on within ASCO. I've been at times tempted to go back and pull those columns together and, and create some sort of a leadership book or a book on, on leadership uh, in, in medicine. I have to say, and I don't want to throw him under the bus, but my, my friend, Paul Goldberg, who publishes the cancer letter, he dismissed all of this with a scoff and said, ah, nobody wants to read that. So it was a little demoralizing to me. Um, and of course I respect his opinion because he's, is a published novelist and accomplished writer. Um, but I may, I may someday develop the, the backbone and find the time to, to overcome his challenge and, and put that together, we'll see. Yeah, because I mean, I'm sure it will be, with all the respect, but I'm sure it will be interesting for many, especially maybe, for the young oncologists. For a few. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure. I mean, uh, in, in my office, uh, and I come back to this book many times, uh, I mean, during the year, it's like this world class, which I got from the airport. I don't know if you had the chance to read it. It's about the re uh, like um, revitalization or kind of revival of uh, New York Langoon. And what, what books are it's that? Langoon Health. It's called World Class. 
Oh yeah, yeah. I've not read it yet. Yes. It's I mean, I think especially for a young professional, it's such a like inspirational and not only inspirational, but also I mean there are day-to-day -day activities and kind of things which are very educational. So I'm sure it, your book will be similar way, very educational. I'm sure. Thank you. Yeah, one thing I would say though, it, it, it's it's an interesting point you just made quickly, which is um a lot of times um it's the small things that are done constantly every day that in the end make the big difference. Yeah. Certainly. In 2007, as you answered the question that um, about getting a call from the patients, and you said, in my opinion, patients should always feel free to call their doctors 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and 365 <laughs> days a year for any concerns, especially related to toxicity or unexpected side effects for chemotherapy, do you still take the calls from your patients? Well, first of all, I don't want to be misunderstood. They should have somebody to call. Oh, okay. Second of all, um, when I took this job, because I took care of patients with breast cancer, and I had a large population of survivors who'd been through adjuvant therapy, I asked for permission to continue to volunteer when I was free to see my follow-up patients unpaid. And so in 2016, I began to see my patients in follow-up uh, in my clinic on Friday afternoons in New York when the office was arguably a little bit slower um, and I was really not seeing anybody who was actually sick. I was seeing people who were taking tamoxifen or taking an aromatase inhibitor by and large, and not seeing or treating anybody with active metastatic disease, for example, not giving parenteral therapy to anybody. So I was, if I see a new patient in that setting, they would by definition have the very lowest risk breast cancer, and they would be basically seen and slotted right into follow-up, if you will. So I did that because Given the opportunity, I wanted to be able to stay in touch with my colleagues and some of the realities of clinical care. Because of that, I still have patients who have occasional issues come up. And in my situation, because the volume is so very low and the urgency and acuteness of all of this is, is low and, and, and the events are rare, yeah, I take calls. In fact, um, of course, I have a great nurse practitioner and colleague who was with me when I was in full-time practice and is still there and is the front line. Uh, but I talk to my patients every week, um, probably several times per week about little things. Increasingly, it's referrals of friends. It's helping them navigate the system for, for family and so forth. Um, but I think that's all part of uh, of being a doctor if you're lucky enough. So yeah, is the short answer is yes, I still absolutely do that. And I still help try as much as I can to help. I will say uh, with um, humility that my practice is getting smaller and smaller with each passing year. Yeah. Sometimes there is a perception that uh, CEOs of societies or hospitals should be like from the business side, managers or not the physicians, but with your, your own story, and I'm sure there are many other stories as well, you prove the opposite. And I'm like for that side as well, that well, physicians I, I, are better I, I, managers. I'm, yeah, but, but there's an, I have to interject something. I'm very fortunate that I happened to be a breast cancer doctor. I happened to be focused on adjuvant therapy for so much of my career, and therefore, I had a practice that could actually be managed this way. With all due respect, if uh, your focus was a much more um, acutely um, challenging disease, be it acute leukemia or, uh, or pancreatic cancer, um, this thing, th this model that I just described is very unlikely to work. So I don't begrudge any CEO or manager who reaches a point where they say it's 
not responsible for me to see patients. You can't be a part-time doc taking care of sick people in my opinion. No, no, no. I was not meaning that. I was meaning that sometimes people are thinking that, I mean, there is some, uh, this kind of discussion that the CEOs of hospitals should not be doctors, like mm. doctors as physicians professionally, but yeah. rather coming from financial side or I don't know, from manager side. But I think that's the opposite because if you have this yeah. like two kind of knowledge and you're coming from the medical field, you you know how the patients are. So doing. that's, a, that's a, a really interesting point. I would say the following. Um, nobody is a, is a master of everything. At least very few people are. Number one, the leadership development program we spoke about earlier and the increasing focus in some quarters on the training and education of physician leaders, I think, makes this particular dilemma um, less of a problem maybe as we go forward. Number two, um, it's all a question of both the individual and the team. So the charter for ASCO mandates a physician CEO. The majority of American professional societies are not led by physicians. They're led by management professionals, often lawyers or MBAs or, or association professionals, uh, of, of which there are many. And what I think in each case they demand is complementarity in the part of the people around them. So for example, there are professionals, uh, I'm sorry, there are healthcare facilities that have established dyad leadership where they have a business expert partnered with a physician, for example. There are others that have been lucky to find physicians with stellar business management and leadership skills so they really can bring it all together. In my case, to be very blunt, I was fortunate to come into ASCO with a very strong C, uh, CFO and a very strong um, colleague who became ultimately our chief operating officer and had tremendous inside knowledge over the decades of ASCO. And so the team of a physician leader with people with operational and financial knowledge from decades is, I think, the reason that, that we've been able to, to, to succeed. But it comes back to the same point, which is it, it takes a team, it takes collaboration, communication. And, and I don't think there's a single answer for any organization. In fact, you'll see organizations over time that have the flexibility that go from one kind of a CEO to another as they try to compensate for what was good and what was lacking in the prior term. So. Uh, I'm flexible in all in my view of all of this. That's my point. Yeah. Uh, how you would describe yourself in one sentence? I am um, motivated and dedicated to. I'm motivated by and dedicated to uh, the premise that an individual can make a difference in the world and make it a better place for all. Thank you so much, and. Um, the last question, uh, who should we interview next? I know you've already interviewed our chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Yeah. Graylaw. Yeah, the pleasure. Um, well, um, certainly I think two names that come immediately to mind uh, would be Dr. Monica Bertignoli, who is the NIH director, and um, uh, Dr. Uh, Kim Rathmel, who replaced her at the NCI. Kim is, of course, I mean, each of them have deep ASCO ties in different ways. Uh, Monica was president of ASCO, and Kim was in our first or second, I can't recall, class of the leadership development program. And um, I think each oh, really? one of them would provide interesting leadership insights for you. Thank you very much for the suggestions. I'm going to write an email them and ask, uh, tell that Dr. Hadis suggested so they will not be able to reject. Ah, uh, well, Thank they you. both work <laughs> for the government, so. I know, I know. I'm just like, yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Hadis, Hadis, and thank you very much for a very interesting uh, interview. It was so inspirational and motivational, and I'm sure people are going to enjoy it. Thank you so well, much. I, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.
Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Anka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.